Good afternoon. I'm Richard McCulley, historian at the Center for Legislative Archives. Thank you for attending today's researcher talk, which resumes this series after a hiatus in August. Our last researcher talk was on July 31st and featured the historian of the U.S. House of Representatives, Matt Wasniewski. So it's entirely appropriate that we kick off the fall programs with our guest today, Catherine A. Scott, assistant historian of the U.S. Senate, who will discuss her very timely book, Reigning in the State, Civil Society, and Congress in the Vietnam and Watergate Era, published by the University Press of Kansas. Kate received her PhD at Temple University and was a visiting professor at Carroll University before joining the Senate Historical Office in 2010. She is no stranger to us at the Center. Kate and her colleagues at the Senate Historical Office have researched our records over the last few years, especially to support the marvelous investigation, investigation section of the Senate Historical Office website. A visit to that website will also make clear that Kate is a wonderful oral historian and is making important contributions to the Senate Oral History Program. She is the recipient of, a research, of research grants from the American Heritage Center to support her next project, a History of the Clarence Thomas Anita Hill Senate Hearings. We will buckle our seat belts and eagerly wait to hear about that <laughs> courageous undertaking when it is completed. Reigning in the state has been highly praised by scholars who have referred to it in the following way, a powerful study, a well-written book that fills a large gap in our knowledge, and an insightful history full of lessons. So we've looked forward to this presentation for some time and the opportunity for questions afterwards. Today's talk is being video recorded. If you have questions, uh, please signal so that we can pass the microphone uh, so that you can be heard on the recording. Also, be aware that the book is available for purchase uh, in the back of the room after the presentation. So thank you, Kate, for this opportunity uh, for us to hear about your work. Thank you, Richard, for that kind introduction, and thank you for joining me here this afternoon on this rather dreary September day. Uh, I especially want to thank the Center for Legislative Archives here at the National Archives for hosting this series of events and then for inviting me to speak at one of them. So today I will be talking about U.S. government surveillance programs, data collection, individual privacy rights, issues that in the past year have become headline news, not only here in the US, but around the world. Whether you think of Edward Snowden as a traitor or a whistleblower, we can all agree that his actions have prompted national conversations at our houses, in businesses across the country, and even at the nation's most powerful intelligence agencies about how best to balance individual rights and civil liberty protections with the government's need to protect national security. So my book, Reigning in the State, explores how Americans confronted these same issues and grappled with similar questions 40 years ago in the 1970s. I began this project as a master's student in history at the University of New Mexico. And as the project began to take shape in 2003, these topics were not international stories and they were relatively mild national stories. <laughs> um, in fact, no one that I knew at the University of New Mexico was really talking about them at all. So I got interested in these issues by chance. That's always how it happens, right? Um, I was looking for a primary source to present in a political history graduate seminar, and a government document specialist at UNM recommended that I take a look at a report published in 1976 um, by the Senate Select Committee to study governmental operations with respect to intelligence activities. It's a mouthful, which is why we know of it colloquially as the Church Committee, um, which named after the Chairman Democratic uh, Senator Frank Church of Idaho. Now this committee um, spent about 16 months in 1975 and 1976 investigating domestic and foreign intelligence programs in the United States. And it was really Congress's first careful examination of these programs, um, which I think some of us will be a little surprised about. 
when I read the report in 2003, I think I experienced what many Americans in 1976 did uh, when these revelations became public through the church committee hearings and report. I was shocked. Um, I was shocked to learn that um, the FBI, the CIA, and something called the NSA, which I didn't know much about then, um, and other lesser known intelligence agencies, including the US Army, had spied on American citizens, had infiltrated organizations in the United States with the intent to foment unrest and destroy the organizations from within, had committed so-called black bag jobs, breaking and entering, stealing, blackmail, wiretapping, all against American citizens and all on US soil. The abuses, carefully documented by Senate investigators, had been the product of programs created during the Cold War crisis and had been ongoing for decades. The violations the committee found were, in the words of the final report, not the product of any single administration, party, or any one man. They were the product instead of the field of intelligence where, to quote the report, too often, constitutional principles were subordinated to a pragmatic course of permitting desired ends to dictate and justify improper means. So reading the church committee report set me on the path to writing this book. It was a very small MA thesis in the beginning, then it became a much larger doctoral dissertation project, and then again, sort of a, a smaller edited version became the book. I was deeply motivated to find answers to two questions that really drove this study. First, how had these programs remained secret for so long? Because in 2003, I knew there were tools like FOIA to get access to information, um, government documents. So why had these programs remained secret for so long? And then secondly, why did they become public when they did in 1975? And why, they were, why were they the subject of this church committee investigation? So when I set out to answer those questions, I turned to the traditional congressional sources, many of which you'll find right here at the Center for, National, um, the Center for Legislative Archives, congressional hearings, committee reports, um, letters to the chairman. I assumed, incorrectly as it turned out, that the main characters in my story would be members of Congress, and maybe a few individuals in these intelligence agencies who had grown uh, uncomfortable with the programs in which they participated. But I quickly realized that the story was going to be far more complicated than that. And frankly, I thought it would make a much better and more interesting story to include people who worked outside of Capitol Hill in this effort. So my book really highlights the roles that good government activists, as I call them, working outside of government, played in enhancing transparency and accountability in American institutions, and especially when it came to the actions of American intelligence and law enforcement agencies in the United States and specifically in the 1970s. So these reformers, who are these people? Uh, who am I talking about? Well, these reformers include people like, whoops, Russ Wiggins, who was editor of the Washington Post and Times Herald throughout the 1950s and 60s. US Army Captain Chris Pyle, a whistleblower who revealed the Army's secret domestic spying program. Arye Nyer, the executive director of the ACLU and Morton Halperin, a former National Security Council staffer turned Nixon administration critic. So my book is an account of how these 1970s reformers built a movement, first built a movement, so actually my book starts in the 1950s, and then proposed a legislative agenda that they believed would empower citizen activists to prevent government abuse in the future. Their calls for reform were driven by their concerns about the health of American democracy in the 1960s and 70s. They believed that the executive branch had become too powerful and too secretive, especially when it came to national security issues. Many suspected, and some accused, national intelligence agencies such as the CIA and FBI with engaging in conduct that violated the very constitution that the government claimed to uphold. Th these were claims that were made prior to the Church Committee revelations in 1975. So I found a, a wide range of public interest groups and individuals who were actively organizing and deeply engaged in the democratic process. They weren't radicals. I mean, that's the part of my story that I, I we have this narrative of the 1960s as sort of this period of radical politicization, especially when we think about subjects like the New Left, students, the SDS. But the people in my study weren't radicals. They didn't want to blow the system up. They wanted to reform it. They wanted to make it better, and they wanted to do that through traditional democratic processes. 
So to that end, they understood that the road to reform would be long and the process arduous and that they might not in the end get exactly what they wanted. In fact, there are many times in my story where they don't all agree on what they want, right? That sounds pretty normal in our, in our current political climate. But as I tell this story, I, I try to emphasize that the people who were part of this movement fought to bring this national security state, which I'll define in a few moments, in line with democratic practice in particular by enhancing transparency and ensuring effective oversight, uh, primarily through um, congressional means. And by those standards, I argue, I think, I found that their efforts were remarkably successful. And I'll get to that in a moment. So today, Americans understand, I'm going to go back to the Pentagon, there we go. Today, Americans understand that dozens of intelligence agencies employing tens of thousands of people here in the US gather information to protect the national security. We all take that for granted. But the growth of this sector of our US government is a relatively recent one. Following World War II with a perpetual war looming on the horizon, elected and appointed officials vastly expanded the national security state. The National Security Act of 1947 established the CIA and the National Security Council and also unified the nation's armed services within a newly formed Department of Defense. Cold War presidential administrations sometimes, although not always working with members of Congress, created new agencies and departments including, in 1952, the National Security Agency. But as this bureaucracy expanded exponentially, it did so with very little oversight, whether by congressional hearings, investigative reporting, or careful examination by public interest groups. Even the national security budget, appropriated by Congress, was a kind of black box that no one, not even the nation's congressional leaders, really knew what was inside. So back to my actors here, Wiggins and Moss. As national security departments and agencies grew, this part of the federal government became increasingly opaque. The first sign of trouble came in 1951, when President Harry Truman established classification standards to, quote, protect the national security against leaks. Journalists protested, claiming that his new policies amounted to a concerted effort to censure the news. Critics charged that the policy would be used to cover up the mistakes of those in public office. Russ Wiggins organized his colleagues, a right-to-know advocacy group of newspaper editors and publishers to denounce the administration's new policies. Then they enlisted the help of Representative John Moss, a Democrat from Northern California who would become their most powerful ally on the Hill in this effort. For the next 15 years, Moss partnered with Wiggins, making a citizen's quote-unquote right to know his signature legislative issue. He held dozens of hearings. He called hundreds of witnesses over the course of that 15 years, including many government officials. Moss and his army of activists, as he liked to call them, challenged administration after administration, first Truman, then Dwight Eisenhower, John F. Kennedy, and Lyndon Johnson. President Johnson's Vietnam War policies became the lightning rod for the right to know activists. As American casualties mounted and the public became increasingly skeptical about the administration's assessment of the war, Americans increasingly pointed to the president's credibility gap. Republican leaders in Congress, like Senator Everett Dirksen and House Minority Leader Gerald Ford, pictured here in their weekly um, media program, uh, pointed to the administration's growing credibility gap. What are we to believe, Mr. President? Wiggins and his colleagues eventually won a major victory when the Freedom of Information Act became law in 1967. It provided reformers with a new tool, a formal mechanism for requesting information from the government. Republicans and, Dem Republicans and Democrats in Congress celebrated the legislation as a great improvement over present policies. Gerald Ford's comment was typical. He hailed the new law as the public's best defense against, quote, the mushrooming growth of government secrecy. The law had its limitations, however, um, noted by organizations like the ACLU because the intelligence agencies were exempt from the FOIA statute. 
But it was the domestic upheavals of the long 1960s, especially the anti-war protests and the urban revolts that prompted Presidents Johnson and Richard Nixon to expand domestic surveillance programs to identify dissidents and quell dissent. Using new computer and database technologies, federal agencies secretly wiretapped, watched, and spied on broad segments of the American population. Congressional investigators found in the 1970s that the U.S. Army and the Justice Department, just those two uh, agencies, maintained 400 databases, which included 200 million files on American citizens. Now, just as a point of reference, in 1970, the total U.S. population was just around 200 million. So a lot has been written about the FBI's COINTELPRO program, a secret domestic surveillance program with a goal to neutralize domestic groups that challenged government policies on the right and the left. But my book takes domestic surveillance a step further because I explore how the Department of Justice and the Department of Defense specifically responded to domestic unrest with, by developing their own surveillance programs in the 1960s. And one of the, one of the characters in my account is Attorney General Ramsey Clark who was a committed liberal and great society advocate who served as attorney general under, um, in the last two years of uh, President Lyndon Johnson's administration. He so distrusted FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover that he created his own intelligence unit within the department in order to circumvent Hoover's power um, to help him better predict when <laughs> and how the next domestic disturbance would occur. At the same time, somewhat problematically, he publicly and privately battled to limit the federal government's legal authority to wiretap, or electronically spy, we could say, on its citizens. So when conservatives in Congress, for example, amended the Safe Streets and Crime Control Act of 1968, which granted the Johnson administration sweeping authority to wiretap virtually anyone for law enforcement purposes, Clark publicly denounced his own administration's measure as a peril to freedom. So back to Detroit. When President Johnson tasked Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara with developing a similar plan to predict future disturbances, McNamara put Lieutenant General William Yarbrough, a counterintelligence expert, in charge of the U.S. Army's program. Now, Yarbrough had a long uh, history as a counterintelligence officer um, behind the Iron Curtain in, um, in Eastern Europe. And he drew on his experiences um, in the early years of the Cold War to develop a program domestically. Uh, but his years abroad left him, frankly, ill-prepared to assess and evaluate domestic issues in the 1960s. His subordinates complained that Yarborough saw a communist behind every bush. When, New York, when Newark, New Jersey, erupted, New Jersey erupted in violence in the summer of 67, he directed his staff to get out your counterinsurgency manuals. We have, a counter, we have an insurgency on our hands. As one officer later recalled, when Detroit erupted the following month, there we were, plotting power plants, radio stations, and armories on the situation maps when we should have been locating the liquor and color television stores instead. So all of these programs might have remained secret if it were not for one man. In 1970, a former Army counterintelligence officer, Christopher Pyle, pictured here, blew the whistle on the Army's domestic surveillance program. Now, his own background made his whistleblower account hard to dismiss. He was not a radical. He was a working class kid who went to Bowdoin College on an ROTC scholarship. Trained in counterintelligence, Pyle did not get shipped to Vietnam. Instead, he became an instructor at the intelligence school just up here in Fort Holabird, Maryland. During the course of teaching a class, a student tipped him off to the Army's domestic surveillance program. As a counterintelligence instructor, he didn't even know about the Army's program. That was a, a problem for him later on. He really had trouble with that. In 1968, Pyle took his student's recommendation and toured the Army's intelligence database facility at Fort Holabird. He was deeply concerned by what he learned there. The program, he found, consisted of 1,500 plainclothes intelligence officers who infiltrated every demonstration in the United States of more than 20 people. And in the 1960s, that was a lot, those were a lot of demonstrations. It wasn't just that the Army gathered data about Americans who <laughs> exercised their constitutional right to protest government policy. It was what the Army did with the information it gathered that most concerned Pyle. The Army used the new technology, used what was then new technology. One of the government's first computers, which was actually about the size of this room, um, to store intelligence data for quick retrieval. 
During his tour, he asked for a computer printout of the type of intelligence that the Army was gathering and compiling. He was surprised to see that the Army included the Unitarian Church among its many targets. He pledged to expose the program when he got out of the Army. So I sat down with Chris Pyle in 2007 at his home in Massachusetts because I wanted to ask him a few questions about his decision to become a whistleblower. Uh, first of all, what motivated him to blow the whistle on the Army's program? He admitted he wasn't a radical, but like many in his generation, the Vietnam War and the draft had made him increasingly distrustful of national leaders and especially Lyndon Johnson. He complained simply, I didn't want my government to have, he explained simply, I didn't want my government to have the ca capabilities of a police state. In January 1970, the Washington Monthly featured Pyle's carefully researched account of the U.S. Army's secret program to monitor domestic politics. Pyle's article set off a firestorm. More than 50 members of Congress fired off angry letters to the U.S. Army demanding to know who had authorized this program. One Senate staffer brought Pyle's article to the attention of his boss, Senator Sam Irvin of North Carolina. He was a conservative Democrat who was best known in the 1960s and, 70 and early 70s for his fierce opposition to civil rights legislation. He had signed the Southern Manifesto in 1954. He had vigorously filibustered the Civil Rights Act in 1964 and the Voting Rights Act in 1965. He was a firm believer in limited government. He was also a civil libertarian who believed deeply in the First Amendment right to protest. How could the U.S. government justify surveillance of peaceful political dissidents? As chairman of the Senate's Constitutional Rights Subcommittee, Irvin requested information about the program from the Army. The Nixon administration refused to provide it, arguing that to do so would undermine national security. Irvin was apoplectic. <laughs> He became even more determined to find answers to his questions. So the first thing he did was hire Chris Pyle to conduct interviews with other former Army domestic counterintelligence officers who had been inspired by Pyle's published whistleblower account and who had also, many of them had also gone public to denounce the program. Over the next mi nine months, Pyle went around the country interviewing more than 50 former officers, and it was their stories that helped Irvin's subcommittee begin to piece together a record of the Army's programs and its targets. Right? If you can't get it from the administration, you're going to have to get it some other way. If you, thought, if you thought that there was a strong response to the revelation that the NSA was tapping German Chancellor Angela Merkel's cell phone, you should have seen the response in 1970 to the news that the Army had been spying on members of Congress. They were furious. When he thought he had the evidence he needed, Irvin announced that his subcommittee would hold public hearings. His staff tackled those hearing preparations like the stage crew for a Broadway show. They aimed to impress the audience, the American people. The performers, subcommittee members, as well as witnesses, must immediately command the respect of their audience. A poor performance might mean bad press and waning public interest. All of these things could adversely affect the subcommittee's bottom line, informing the public and elected officials in Congress in order to garner support for a particular legislative agenda. And Senator Irvin had something in mind, which we'll get to in a bit. Irvin's staff set the ideal stage, opening the hearings in February of 1971 in the Senate's Grand Caucus Room in the old Senate Office Building, the site of a number of notable Senate investigations. His staff worked hard to ensure that the media would be there. Effective congressional hearings should educate, I've been told by Senate staffers, and to do that requires the cooperation of the nation's media outlets. Irvin's staff knew that if they promised a good show, portions of the hearings would be rebroadcast on the evening news and that newspapers would feature the hearings on the front page above the fold. And that was their goal. They wanted the public to get fired up. Senator Irvin, for his part, proved an able performer. His folksy charm and grandfatherly demeanor endeared him to the media and his at-home audience. On opening day, he leaned over the grand wooden dais of the Senate caucus room. Peering over his thick rimmed reading glasses, he hefted aloft in one hand a thick, hardbound, 11-pound Bible. In his other hand, he held aloft between th thumb and forefinger a perfect two-inch square of microfilm, which he explained contained the same 1,200 pages of text. Computer technology, he exclaimed, now makes the storage of information infinite. Someone remarked, 
Irvin said, this meant the Constitution could be reduced to the size of a pinhead. He chortled, maybe that was what they had done in the executive branch because some of those Nixon officials couldn't see it with their naked eyes. Irvin's staff packed the witness list with privacy experts who testified to the chilling effect that government surveillance was likely to have on Americans. This Orwellian nightmare, said one, threatened First Amendment rights and might create, in his words, a generation of silent Americans. The public responded immediately to Irvin's hearings, flooding his office with letters of support. So public opinion is difficult to gauge for any historian without relying too heavily on public opinion polls. And frankly, in the 1970s, those polls were a little spotty anyway. Um, one of the things I always like to do as a researcher is look at the letters that people write to their elected officials. There's a, there are great collections here and the investigation files. I love looking at letters that Americans write, trying to make this sort of connection with the people who represent them in Congress. And I was really fortunate in this regard that Irvin published the letters that he received after this hearing in an appendix to the hearing transcripts. There were hundreds of letters that he included and I suspect many more that he did not. Um, the letters themselves came from people all across the country. They explained to him that they had lost their faith in national leaders and that they feared the government's unchecked power and habitual secrecy. Some compared the government's surveillance tactics to the totalitarian Soviet Union, right? In the context of the Cold War, that's a big claim. Of the hundreds of letters his committee received, the concerns expressed by this Texan woman were typical. On the national level, this army surveillance program sounds more like George Orwell's 1984 than the USA. On the personal level, how do I know I'm not in someone's file? Pyle's article and Irvin's investigation translated complicated constitutional issues, separation of powers, checks and balances, abuse of executive power, into a narrative that average Americans like the Texas woman I mentioned could grasp. Should the president have the authority to deny information to Congress and therefore in, uh, affect congressional oversight? What type of information should legitimately be withheld under the national security label? Did Americans have a right to protection from government surveillance? The questions remain unanswered, but Irvin's hearings prompted a national conversation. Now, while he assisted Senator Irvin's subcommittee investigation, Pyle was moonlighting for the ACLU <laughs> as a research assistant. He was very busy in this period. He was also doing his PhD um, in their public interest litigation section. The well-staffed and well-funded project was the brainchild of Arye Nair, ACLU's executive director. Nair was a German-born Jew whose family had just barely escaped the Nazi regime. And he had been a lifelong leftist with a healthy skepticism, in his words, of all ideologies. He had helped to create Students for a Democratic Society in the early 60s, but he soon became disillusioned with the organization. The ACLU really liked his politics, and even more, they liked his organizing experience, and so they hired him in the early 1960s. And one of his first projects was that he tried to, he was working at the ACLU in, in the state of New York, and he was trying to uh, document police brutality against anti-war protesters in New York. It was Nyer's idea that the ACLU should hire attorneys to challenge First Amendment violations by intelligence agencies. He envisioned this in the 1960s. The problem was they didn't have evidence that the government was spying on citizens. Well, they didn't have evidence until Pyle published his whistleblower account. So that's how those two made the connection. With Congress slow to respond to intelligence abuses, you know, the process of investigating and holding hearings is a, is a long one. Nyer developed a plan that he hoped would force judicial oversight of intelligence activities and also limit executive power. He was especially determined to rein in the executive branch's exercise of broad authority in electronic surveillance, which was back then wiretapping. In most cases, um, wiretapping personal telephone lines. Though the ACLU lost their first cases, they eventually won a major decision in 1972. In the US, V um, U.S. District Court ruling, Nixon appointee Lewis Powell wrote the majority opinion. The president had no constitutional authority to conduct electronic surveillance of American citizens on U.S. soil, the majority wrote, without a judicially issued, issued search warrant based on a finding of probable cause. Without careful checks on the system, explained Powell, targets of official surveillance may be those suspected of unorthodoxy in their political beliefs. It was in the context of the court's ruling restricting executive powers in the realm of national security that the Watergate scandal began to unfold. <laughs>
So the Watergate story is one with which we're all very familiar. As a professor, I've taught it to my college students, it seems like hundreds of times, as one of the most significant events in recent American history, and it is. Um, the story typically begins with the break-in at the DNC headquarters at the Watergate office complex here in Washington, and, and sometimes ends with the president's resignation in 1974, or maybe with Gerald Ford's pardon um, of the former president for any crimes that he may have committed while in office. My book, though, tries to place Watergate and the crimes of Watergate, the black bag jobs, illegal wiretaps, and political surveillance, into a much broader historical context. The Watergate hearings under Chairman Sam Irvin's direction, remember he's the chairman of the Watergate committee, simply brought to sharp relief for the media and the American public the abuses that the executive branch more broadly and the intelligence agencies more specifically had perpetrated on the American public for years, if not decades. Through its newsletters, letter to the editor campaigns, and partnerships with sympathetic journalists, the ACLU successfully used Watergate as the prism through which Americans could come to see the issues of political surveillance, government secrecy, and executive power as interrelated and inherently damaging to the democratic process. Even before President Nixon resigned in August of 1974, Irvin and his allies in Congress drafted legislation to address the myriad issues made public by whistleblowers, public interest groups, and congressional inquiries. In 1974, Congress addressed some abuses by passing the Privacy Act and revising the Freedom of Information Act to make some of those intelligence agencies actually have to respond to FOIA requests. The Church Committee investigation soon followed. It was just a, a, the next year. And it revealed systemic intelligence abuses perpetrated on the American public by the FBI, CIA, and what was then a largely unknown agency called the National Security Agency. When the Church Committee released its final report in 1976, organizations like the ACLU and its partners pushed hard for broad legislative reform, including the creation of permanent congressional intelligence oversight committees, which happened in the Senate, uh, in the uh, Senate and in the House in subsequent years. Uh, also charters for the CIA and FBI, which did not come to pass, and the passage of um, a domestic wiretapping bill that would protect American citizens from electronic surveillance. So my book begins with the right to know activism of Russ Wiggins, and it concludes with the passage of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, which we now know as FISA. The law allowed electronic surveillance only through the express authority of the law, by the approval of a secret court of seven judges appointed by the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. It effectively challenged 30 years of precedent, when courts and Congress had effectively granted the executive the inherent power in national security cases as justification for warrantless surveillance. Okay, so now back to the two questions that started this project 12 years ago. Why did these programs stay secret for so long? Well, I think there are two, I, I tease out two explanations, two possible explanations. The first is that in the context of the Cold War, Congress had adopted an ends justify means attitude and did not exercise regular and effective oversight. But the turbulent events of the 1960s, the increasingly unpopular war in Vietnam especially, the limitations of the war on poverty, the assassinations of Martin Luther King and Robert Kennedy, the urban riots and campus protests throughout the decade, seriously undermined the American public's belief in the competency of polit political figures and government institutions to solve the nation's big problems. The battle to reign in the state didn't begin or end in the 1970s. I don't argue that. But this successful movement does offer us a lens through which we can better understand the parameters, I think, of our current debates. Though the executive branch continues to have extraordinary powers, particularly in the conduct of foreign relations and national security, my book emphasizes that state power is historically contingent. So today, in the wake of 9-11, many of us question the efficacy of the FISA law, born in a non-digital age. How applicable is it today? But I think to fairly assess it, we have to understand the historical context in which it was created and what it was, uh, what, why it was created and what it was a response to, the abuses of this Cold War, this long Cold War era. Laws are only good as the citizens and the institutions willing to use them and who demand that government obey them. Perhaps some work remains to be done in that regard. I don't know, well, hopefully we can talk about that in the discussion section. But before I, I take your questions, I'd like to leave you with a few of my own. 
In the wake of the terrorist attacks of September 11th, our national conversation about the need to strike a balance between national security and civil liberties has waxed and waned. Where do we stand today as a nation on these issues? I'd love for that to be part of our conversation. I'll be curious to know how you might answer that question if you're talking about this to your colleagues and your family at home. I'd like to ask you to think too about this model from the past and the kind of lessons that we might learn from it. Pyle, Nyer, Irvin, and his staff, they all recognized that legislative change would only come after educating the American public. For that reason, I think, these reformers were very careful about constructing a story of abuses, a narrative that average citizens could understand. And that's in part why I highlighted that specific Irvin uh, investigation. They organized campaigns to educate. The ACLU used newsletters, letters to the editor, campaigns, and traditional publications like newspapers to help the public understand how the issues affected their individual lives. So as some of the best legislators do, Irvin um, was particularly attuned to how televised hearings might play a role in educating the public. Remember back then there were only three networks, so it was a little bit easier to get the public focused on one particular issue. Establishing a narrative that people can understand, which journalists I think sometimes do so well, is so important to focusing um, and generating publish, public debate on these types of issues. So that leaves me with the final question, would these techniques work today? And I, I don't know, but I'd like to end with that question and hopefully we can open it up for a general discussion about what you all think about these issues. Thank you. Anybody? Good. Well, Kate, I think your study is remarkable. And I'd like to, I'm waiting to read your book. I think it's going to be very good. But I wondered, um, you're talking about constructing narratives. And I just wondered with the, um, the role of the press and organizations like the ACLU constructing narratives in mm -hmm. the 60s, which mm -hmm. exposed the issue, I wonder if you have any comments yourself on the government's role since 2001 in constructing a narrative on the other side of the question. Yes, so let me, let me back up and answer that a little historically by saying that what's one of the things that, one of the many things that surprised me as I was working on this project is the lack of government response when these whistleblowers came out in the late 60s and early 70s. The, the, the agencies, and I haven't looked through all the agency records as I have through the ACLU records, for example, but the agencies seemed very slow to respond. I think they were really caught by surprise. They didn't realize, they had frankly had a lot of protection for a really long time. And um, I don't think that they were, uh, they weren't prepared to construct narratives. They were sort of slow to get into the debate. And when they did get into the debate, um, many of them, like let's say um, Clarence Kelly at the FBI, for example, says, well, we do have to look at what we've been doing. This is not, you know, after, after Hoover passes away, we have a new FBI director, and he, he says, these, some of these programs, I mean, these are clearly, they're shaky constitutional grounds here, let's try and clean this up. So some of the leaders within these agencies took a step back and said, we need to reevaluate what we're doing, right? And in, in, in light of a changing public opinion about the role of our intelligence agencies in American life, um, we probably ought to rethink how we're doing this. Um, so to contrast that with today, uh, again, I haven't done the work to know how these agencies work today and how they're organized, but I would think that their, their response, I think, has been much quicker. They, when, when Snowden began to leak the, and The Guardian began to publish his, the materials that he had collected, um, I mean, it was, the response was immediate and it was swift and there were words used like he's a traitor. And so an, a, an immediate condemnation of what he had done. Now, I'm not condoning what he's done, but just to say that the response has been very different from the institutional side. Um, and so perhaps that's why this type of approach with uh, among a conser um, concerned citizens and organizations like the ACLU may not work today because their adversary is much stronger and more um, uh, has constructed a narrative that I think that's quite effective and also um, has some statutes in place to help them make their argument about these things are illegal. You're not supposed to take documents and leak them, right? Um, so I hope that answers your question. It does. Okay. Anybody? Yes. 
Hi, my name is Maria Kristen. I'm a former employee of the National Archives. I'm currently a federal historian, uh, 41 years government service. Um, here at the National Archives, I was the team leader on the Nixon tapes for the oh, disclosure wow. review cool. um, during the 1980s. Um, and so my question goes to the Nixon records. There are two aspects to it, one of which I'll just comment on the other um, for which I have a question for you. Um, I came to believe that we essentially had an intellectually unfunded mandate. It was up to us to make it work. We were the transitional statute between uh, the donated right. series of, of presidential records and the Presidential Records Act. So mm -hmm. it was an interesting position yeah, to be I'm in. Sure. Um, with the Nixon records, it was our uh, job to uncover the full truth about the governmental abuses of power known as Watergate. Mm -hmm. So of course we, we did what we could. Um, those records have finally been released almost in full. There's about 700 hours that the National Archives still is going back and looking at for, for various restrictions. Um, have, did you actually have a chance to work with any of the Nixon records, either the tapes or the um, paper records? And among the textual records, because you mentioned letters from constituents, there's a very rich and large, largely untapped body of material in terms of public correspondence mm. to the president, and which cool. speaks to what he was reacting to mm -hmm. as up on the hill people Absolutely. were reacting to mm -hmm. other correspondence. So I'd be interested to hear what you work with. That's a great question. And how cool that you worked on that. <laughs> that must have been so fun. Um, so I did not use the Nixon White House records. I did use the Department of Justice records, and I believe I also looked at the Department, uh, the Army's records as well, because this happened during the Nixon administration. And I was specifically trying to piece, I was trying to understand how they developed these programs, and I actually, you know, I don't think that, I think that came for all the right reasons, which is to respond to this immediate domestic crisis, um, but then they, the tools sort of became used in the wrong ways. Um, so that was what I was looking, I was mainly focused on those records, but you, that's a great point that Americans, of course, would have written a lot of letters to President Nixon. Um, perhaps, I would think, supporting him in his effort to um, stonewall members of Congress or protect, you know, that's maybe a little biased, to protect very, national very security. There's, there's, there's <laughs> it's all across the board? Spectrum, oh, yeah. cool, okay. So. No, I didn't, and now I'm kicking myself that I didn't, because that would have been a great place to look. Um, Maybe a that's a good point. Sometime. Maybe, or at least an article, yeah. right? Yeah, that'd be cool. That would be really cool. Yeah, good, good point. Um, Kate, I, I'm on a panel at, uh, going to give a book award <laughs> We're receiving books, and I got one yesterday. Ah, okay. Um, and the title was Iran-Contra, and the subtitle ah. is Reagan Scandal and the Unchecked Abuse of Presidential Power. Yes, yes. Well, that's, that's, this, this, that's the question, isn't yeah, it? Like, how effective were these reforms? Because a decade after your story ends, absolutely. basically. Mm -hmm. So there's some kind of turnaround. Yes. Uh, there's a lot of decrying <laughs> of uh, the lack of, of, of uh, equal justice and holding those in power to account in mm -hmm. the way we saw happen mm -hmm. uh, during the period you study. Yes. I, I guess I'm wondering, what is the norm in terms of our civic life? Good question. Uh, uh, did did the, the 1970s, 60s express a civic norm mm -hmm. that has since eroded? Or was eroded, it an aberration? Or is it an aberration? Right. That's I'd a like to question. hear your thoughts on that. That is a fabulous question. I think that in some ways it was an aberration in the sense that <clears throat> There were so many problems <laughs> coming down the road at the same time that elected officials and institutions failed to effectively address that s confidence in those elected officials and institutions eroded to an extent that was in some ways unprecedented, perhaps, and allowed these reformers to have a real influence on how the reforms would be, you know, how the reform effort would take shape. 
So in that sense, it might be an aberration. But what I would say that um, about the, the, the case of Iran-Contra, to put this in a longer trajectory, while it does suggest that the Reagan administration exercised a great deal more executive power, um, it also suggests that some of those tools created in the 1970s era did work because they were able to uncover this problem and Congress immediately investigated the issue rather than doing it 30 years later as they did in the case of the, some of the investigations in the 1970s. I've recently been, had the pleasure, the privilege of interviewing um, people who served as the staff for the church committee. We're doing a church committee oral history project in our office. Uh, because next year is the 40th anniversary of the creation of that committee. And one of them recently explained to me that he thought, in terms of the legacy of the church committee and this larger reform movement in the 1970s, that it was quite successful, not only because it put in place these new statutes, but also because things like Iran-Contra suggested that this new system worked, right? That they were able, that Congress was able to to check executive power. And that Reagan, after Iran-Contra, moved in this person's mind more carefully. Um, I don't know, I haven't done enough work to evaluate that. But I do think that if we just think about today's political culture, today's political culture, that Americans assume that they should have access to all the information they can have access to. That they assume that, um, that, that there should be a, a, a level of transparency in our American political, in our political life, in our political culture. And that that transparency is absolutely vital to the system of checks and balances and uh, assuring some level of accountability. And I think that that culture is really a product of this 1970s reform effort that prior to the 1970s, I don't believe there was a consensus that we have a right to know. There were activists who were demanding it, but there were no statutes in place. And I think that we've taken these tools, this, these tools created in the 1970s, like the Privacy Act and, the FOIA, and FOIA, and we've made them a part of our political lives. We, we, we assume we should be able to use these tools to get access to the information that we want. And I don't, I don't even think that that assumption is just shared among journalists. I think basically Americans believe that that's true, with some notable exceptions related to national security. Um, and so I think that 1970s movement, perhaps more than maybe some of the statutes which have been circumvented, like FISA and things since then, um, the, the change, it, it, it shaped our political culture. And I think that political culture is very much with us today. Hi. Hey, Kate. Um, Hi. I have two questions for you. One is, how did the House and Senate justify exempting themselves from FOIA? <laughs> um, and the other is now there there is a, a, a little bit of a trend of having f maybe not fewer, but but Congress putting major investigations in the hands of independent commissions yes. as yes. opposed to investigative committees. Mm -hmm. Could you talk yes. about that a little yes. bit, please? Yes, so that's one of the things that's come up, actually it's been something I've been talking to these church committee folks about a lot. Um, because I've asked them, <clears throat> would you recommend, a, a, do we need a modern church committee? Do we need to have another assessment mm -hmm. of the actions and programs developed by our intelligence agencies, given the Snowden documents? And most of them have agreed that, yes, we do need something. We need to have a general reassessment of what these programs are doing. Where they disagree is how that should happen. So many of them have said within um, our modern political environment, they can't imagine that a congressional committee could be formed. That the House and Senate, well, that let's say either chamber would, um, would agree to form a, a church-like committee. Um, there are jurisdictional issues because we have permanent congressional intelligence oversight committees, um, but probably more importantly, there are a lot of issues uh, that, are, that are competing for their attention right now. 
Um, many of them have suggested, given that situation, we probably should have, in lieu of doing nothing, we should have something like a, pres a presidential a presidentially appointed committee or some hybrid where we have um, folks from let's say the the top three committees judiciary um, mm. permanent intelligence and um, and let's say armed services um, the chairman of those committees would serve on this hybrid committee the president would appoint some and and one gentleman said hey why not have the judiciary appoint a couple people because they also have a hand in this game and they should be part of this conversation and wouldn't that be cool to have all the three branches represented on this commission so i've asked them well do you think that that has the power of a congressional committee which as most of you know congressional investigations typically have legislative recommendations at the end that's the point right really like how do we fix this problem we just identified well we need to do it with legislation and in my mind, the insiders, the people in Congress, are the best people to be um, <coughs> promoting those recommendations. You know, that's how they would get coalitions built to actually pass legislation at the end of this process. And they agreed that if people were outside of, you know, if, if the members were outside of Congress, it doesn't pack the same punch. It doesn't have, so I think you're absolutely right that we've witnessed a, a a, a, a big shift away from sort of these big congressional investigations and toward these other types of commissions outside. Um, and I think that, that the jury's still out on how effective those are. Um, I think what needs to be written would be a cool, uh, there are a couple great books on notable investigations, which also include these con commission models. Um, but it would be neat if somebody did like a really comparative historical analysis of legislative outcomes. And what is it that we hope to get out of these commissions if they're not attached to Congress? Um, in terms of your first point, Congress is always writing themselves out of legislation. We all know that. <laughs> um, so I'm not at all surprised, but I didn't look into that specific issue. Um, I think, though, to be perfectly fair, if I was, you know, having looked so much at Senator Irvin's material, for example, that he believed that it was the executive branch that was abusing <coughs> power and that, that Congress had been derelict in its duty of exercising con consistent oversight. And so the problem wasn't with Congress, it was with the executive branch. Um, and so probably for the people involved, if I was interviewing them today and I asked that very good question, they would probably answer, well, it wasn't Congress's problem. It was, you know, we need to transparency in the executive branch because that's where the abuses were. Congress always does everything right, right? <laughs> so I, it's not a great answer, probably a little too glib, but. I had a, um, Paul Pittman. I Hi. work for the Office of the Historian at the Department of State. Oh, great. And I, I had a question that follows on from the question about narratives. Mm -hmm. um, I was wondering if you ran across materials uh, that explained what narrative the executive branch told itself when it set up these domestic surveillance. Yeah. Great question. And then my question would be, well, there's two questions from that. <laughs> One is, was it similar to the narrative that they would use for foreign intelligence? So oh, we're, we're yeah. Did they separate the two? Mm -hmm. we're, no. we're really we have the same threat, it's just active in the United States mm -hmm. now, and, mm -hmm. and perhaps the, the view that that threat was active within the U.S. actually went back quite a ways. Mm -hmm. And the, the second question would be, whatever narrative the executive branch told itself, mm -hmm. um, when the executive branch responded to Pyle and mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. the criticism, yes. did they change their story or did they basically come back with what I would expect would have been somewhat persuasive to a lot of people. Yes, right, no, you're, that's, that's a good point. Okay, so to the point of narratives and um, from the perspective of the executive branch, you won't be surprised being at the State Department that they were very, many narratives <laughs> and each department and agency seemed to have their own. Um, and in some cases they seemed to be competing and in most of cases they weren't speaking to one another at all, right? Um, uh, to the point of, um, for example, let me just take the case of the FBI. <laughs> when, when they interviewed, when the church committee investigators interviewed um, folks at the FBI, 
um, they, and this is in the church committee report, um, nothing classified here. When they interviewed these people, um, there was a consistent narrative within the FBI, which was, we didn't ask questions about the constitutionality of these programs. And one, I think it was William Sullivan, who was, I think, the number three at the FBI during much of this period. He famously said, and it's been quoted so many times, you can Google it right now, um, something to the effect of, we never asked that question. I can't remember anyone ever asking, is this constitutional? Is it legal? Should It wasn't something we even considered. We had a task, it was to identify communists in the United States, and that's the way we approached all of these problems, really. They were all about identifying communism in the United States. In terms of the question of domestic versus foreign intelligence, um, that, what I found there is just that the institutional approach, at least let's say in the case of the Army, was we have developed these counterintelligence and counterinsurgency programs. They worked behind the Iron Curtain. We know they were effective. We're going to take those people trained there, and we don't have to retrain them. We're going to put them here in the United States, and they're going to do exactly the same thing. And Yarborough being the perfect guy in my story to illustrate that point, which is that in his mind, he, was, he, he couldn't identify, he had no way of identifying and understanding the complicated nature of the American political environment at that time, and the reason why students were taking to the streets and protesting. In his mind, it was all about communism. They, must, they were inspired by communists. You know, There must be communists in there somewhere. We will find them. And that's very much so. In that case, let's say there would be a shared narrative between folks like Yarborough and, of course, they're not talking to each other, but Yarborough and, let's say, a J. Edgar Hoover or a William Sullivan. There were communists everywhere. We needed to find them. If we could do that, these protests would stop and tranquility would return to the United States, which suggests that they were largely out of touch with the larger issues in the United States at the time. So in terms of the overlap between foreign and domestic, that's where I see it. I see that we have a foreign problem. It's probably the same problem here at home. Let's take these tools, use them here. We'll have, we think, the same success, the same kind of result. Um, the way that they responded to Pyle was by not responding. <laughs> Nobody said anything. He told me that he was certain, and having his training, I, I really do believe this, he was certain that he was being tailed all the time. So he took to, um, he built this, he had a Volkswagen Beetle, and he built this custom box that he put in the trunk with like big padlocks on it. And everywhere he went, he had different ways of securing his interview material from all these counterintelligence officers. So he would go from his apartment in Col near Columbia University, he would go down, he would lock the materials in his car, he would drive somewhere, he would take them out, he would bring, he always was in possession of these things because he was convinced that he was being tailed. He had a friend who was, who was a photographer who followed him and would snap pictures of people in the street trying to see if they could figure out who it was tailing him. Um, but other than that, there was no, uh, no one ever said we're gonna, you know, we're you violated a law. We're going to arrest you. There wasn't even talk about him being a traitor. Um, a totally different response um, but than what we would see today. I hope that answered those questions. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much, everybody. I know we're we're out of time, but thank you so much for coming. I appreciate it very much. Thank you.